Hi, everyone. I'm really excited to be here. This is my first ever DICE, and uh, it's really great to be here in sunny Barcelona. Today, I'm going to talk to you about live streaming, and I'm sure everyone knows what Twitch is, what YouTube gaming is, how people play them, etc. But uh, I'm going to talk from a perspective of a really small company, like we're just a dozen people uh, right now. That's why we can still classify ourselves as indie. And I'm basically going to talk about five things today. I'm going to talk about the rise and fall of what I call the early tiny build before we all went full time. We had a hit game that was in the top charts that went down to sell a million units and just fell off the charts uh, for reasons, well, we missed the live streaming bandwagon. And then I'm going to talk about examples of games that have done live streaming really well, that I have a personal experience playing and experiencing them on Twitch. Uh, then I'm going to talk about how we essentially invented, I want to claim that, but uh, People have done it before, um, but we uh, pushed Twitch integration with a game called Party Hard, and right a month after that, it went mainstream. Um, then uh, you probably heard about uh, Punch Club and our little marketing stunt with Twitch Plays Punch Club. I'm going to talk a little bit about that, but the, mainly the presentation is going to be about how we found something that works for us uh, and how the industry changes every four years in a way that, well, it can make your game fall off a cliff and then you can have a ton of opportunities to uh, leverage new emergent ways to promote your games. And then we'll talk about how we're now designing games uh, with live streaming in mind. So let's do a short intro uh, and uh, dive uh, into Tiny Build. So uh, about myself, I was born in a little country called Latvia uh, in Eastern Europe right there. Um, right now, I live in the Netherlands, um, and I had a very odd career. I'm 28. Uh, I dropped out of high school when I was about 14, then I eventually came back and, you know, kind of worked and studied part-time. Uh, I dropped out to pursue a career in pro gaming, which was odd. Um, that was not a good choice. Uh, don't do that. Um, after, you know, playing uh, Warcraft 3 with uh, Koreans in the World Cyber Games, I realized that I shouldn't do that. Uh, then I started writing about games and became quite successful in that. I was a games journalist. Uh, and being a games journalist, that's a really good gateway into uh, actual game production because what you can do is uh, you can become a really good producer after writing about a ton of games because you review games and uh, you can eventually, uh, when you understand how games are made, you can become a really good producer and anticipate what is going to come out as a result. Uh, then I spent a few years working as a marketing executive at large companies, uh, and then gaining that experience led me to uh, co-founding Tiny Build, where right now I'm acting as CEO and a hands-on producer on most of our titles. And fun fact, um, you're probably like, what does no citizenship in the world mean? That's a thing that is actually uh, possible, because when the Soviet Union fell, uh, about 200,000 people in Latvia, uh, one of which is me, uh, have no citizenship in the world, which makes it very interesting when you try to fly to the US from Amsterdam and then uh, they slide your passport and it goes nationality XX or NA. And you just go like, um, okay, what is this? They call the manager, then the airport security comes in. It's a whole thing. People say that they have difficulties traveling. Well, try that. <laughs> and then uh, this is kind of my commute uh, every few weeks uh, because we have a publishing uh, office in Seattle and our studio in the Netherlands. I moved to the Netherlands about seven years ago, and as of a few years, I spend my time, well, probably almost equally between the two. So imagine what that's like when you constantly have the issue of sliding the passport. Now, Tiny Build started, uh, oddly enough, on Kickstarter five years ago. And, um, you know, Kickstarter today is a very common way to fund games. Everyone knows it, uh, everyone knows what it's like, everyone has seen success. But we um, raised, in 2011, we raised $26,000, which was a record for video games at the time. Because back then, there was absolutely no video game success on Kickstarter. There were a few board games where people you know, understood how board games are produced and whatnot. Uh, and we were one of the very first games that uh, got funded on Kickstarter, which uh, was phenomenal. You know, we're just two guys that met online on Newgrounds, a Flash Gaming website. We're like, yeah, let's make a video game. Oh, here's this Kickstarter thing, let's do it. Uh, shortly after we developed it, uh, Steam Greenlight came along and we were in the second batch of greenlit games. And that was like way before the floodgates opened. So back then, Steam was a really, really big thing. Because um, if before 2013 you were on Steam, that was most of the job already done for an indie developer. So if you were an indie uh, and then you were on Steam, that was really good. Uh, means that you know, you'll have good, uh, if you have good reviews on Metacritic, that meant that you'll, you, know, you might star in indie game the movie. 
Um, so we released the game uh, and you know, hoping for great reviews, hoping to live the dream and whatnot, and then stuff like this happened. So our first game, No Time to Explain, uh, was not getting really good reviews, but that's mostly because um, we were not coders, so I was a producer and then uh, the co-founder Tom Bryan was the designer and programmer and everything else. So building a game in Flash for Steam was not the best idea. Uh, our main critic averaged out at about 54%, and you can imagine the devastation on launch day when the reviews start coming in, and we just go like, okay, we're done. Like, we're not making games anymore. This was a bad idea. Let's go back, get uh, office jobs. So on launch day, we were all kind of devastated, um, really depressed. Uh, but then uh, I log into the admin, and I go like, huh, F5. Huh. And back then, Steam uh, reporting was live, so you could see live stats. And you go like, why is this, why is this selling? Why is this selling really well? Um, and that was because um, I, I already mentioned that we missed the live streaming bandwagon. But before live streaming came along, we actually jumped on exactly the right moment of the YouTuber bandwagon. When uh, folks like Markiplier, uh, he's now you know, huge at the time. Uh, he's huge now, but at the time, he was just starting out. And his let's play for No Time to Explain, our game, was one of the first big videos for that let's player, and the same for a ton of others. Uh, I'm gonna show a short clip, I apologize if the volume's off, uh, of like the beginning of the game and his reaction to it. I am you from the future. There's no time to explain. Follow me to, oh Christ! Ah! Yeah! Ah, okay. <laughs> so, that short intro, um, that's the intro to the game, and that's what sold everyone on it. Uh, when you saw Let's Players do that, you know, like their reaction was what was selling the game. So all of a sudden, we had a critical flop, but the commercial success on our hands. So we're like, well, let's make game two. I mean, why not? Let's, let's go with it. Uh, our game two ended up being a game called Speedrunners, uh, which I found at an indie showcase thing in Hamburg where I was just stumbling around, sat down, and I was like, this is the best game in the world. What are you guys doing with it? And the development team of two people, uh, they had released this game as Speedrunner HD on Xbox Live indie game, and it was a complete flop. Uh, they did not sell well, um, and one of the reasons for that was the visual style. Like, what you see now is a reimagining of that, so I just came up to them, played the game for a few hours, and said, well, we have this money from No Time to Explain, why not invest that into you guys, uh, so we can kind of co-develop it slash publish it and see what happens. So we spent uh, eight months uh, developing that or reimagining it, implemented online multiplayer, and uh, that quote right there, one of the most competitive online multiplayer games you'll ever play, is actually from PewDiePie. So I'm gonna show uh, a little early let's play of PewDiePie. There's gonna be a lot of video, by the way, in this presentation, hope you don't mind. So this is a short uh, clip from uh, PewDiePie's let's play of Speedruns. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, that was close. Yes! Ken, what, you touched? Oh, now I'm just confused. Like, uh, there's, there's no, we're not, we're just floating oh, in the I air. I get it, you're supposed to up. run. I get it. Shut up. I have rockets. Ah! Kill. No, I shot myself. Oh, okay, I didn't die. <laughs> Where are we going? I don't know, oh, no one. I'm going up here, guys. Oh, never mind. Tricked you. Don't yeah, grapple me. How dare you grapple me? There's a lawyer. Okay. Oh. That's a nice frame to end that, huh? Um, so the Let's Plays that we were getting, um, they were all over the place. Uh, it's a simple 2D platformer that's very, very easy to pick up. And very soon after, we were getting a ton of sales and a ton of fan art like this. And originally we were like, oh great, our game has become really popular. Uh, look at this fan art of the game. No, this is actually fan art of PewDiePie playing the game. Then we had like tons and tons of other uh, pieces of fan art where a ton of other YouTubers started playing it. And it was just skyrocketing, it was insane. Uh, it got so popular amongst YouTubers that at one point we just decided to include all of them in the game. Like there are two DLC packs with characters of uh, less players in the game. Uh, then we went on to sell a million units, which was fantastic. Um, and you know, we're, okay, we're done. We're like indie, cool, this, this is nice. But then all of a sudden the sales just stop. And I'm gonna talk about why they stopped uh, a little bit after I talk about YouTubers and uh, less players and the difference between them. But essentially uh, it just, it just stopped selling uh, when live streamers started to matter much more uh, than YouTubers when it comes to sales. 
because uh, in terms of YouTubers, their personalities and they, uh, you know, everyone became a YouTuber at one point a few years ago. And people now watch them for their personalities, not necessarily to discover new games because they just follow those people. So if we talk about the difference between YouTubers and, and streamers, uh, the main ones that I would want to highlight is that with YouTubers, um, it's very easy to cut out the boring parts. Like you make a long video and then you just slice it up. Then um, it's easy to kind of fake the reactions. So you know, you like you have a slapstick comedy game where like everything is flying around. You're like you're making surgery or whatnot, uh, and you just you know you fake your reaction. It's great. You shout in the microphone. It's really annoying, but kids love it. There is also no direct interaction with the audience. Uh, like all of the interaction happens well, like uh, in pre-recorded sessions on Twitter, on Facebook, and whatnot. But you're not really doing that live, so it's a totally different skill set for them. And um, what that facilitates is uh, that it's very easy to find the celebrities and their content. You just search for you know like whatever game name, and then you'll find the top let's plays, and then you'll see exactly who is a top YouTuber for a specific game. So it's very easy. Now, if, you, if we look at streamers, it's a different story. There is absolutely no way to cut out the boring parts. All of that is happening live. There is no way to filter through that. And then you need to constantly acknowledge and interact with your audience because you have subscribers. Uh, each time a subscriber logs into the chat, you need to say hi, and people do that. It's a lot of multitasking. Uh, you need to uh, read the chat and like see what's going on. And imagine what it's like to do that when you have you know, 500 people or 10,000 people watching. It's really, really difficult. And um, the most difficult part for me, and I think this is a major reason why we missed the live streaming bandwagon, is because it's difficult to pinpoint who is a top streamer, like uh, what is their content, what kind of games they play, because all of it happens live. And when your biggest market is the US and you're based in Europe, that becomes very difficult to do. Like, you know, someone played your game at 4 a.m. and had 20,000 people watching. Okay, what they do, what they like, uh, why did they enjoy it, how did they find it, et cetera. Uh, so the reason speedruns fell off the charts uh, is mostly because of this screen. Uh, this is a screenshot of, like, I think, iteration number 971 of the lobby where you matchmake, where you uh, figure out what character you want to choose, where you invite friends, where you uh, do all of the fun stuff to set up an actual match. Because the game itself is very simple. It's four player, multiplayer uh, platformer, essentially. Uh, the problem was that YouTubers would go past the screen, they would invite each other and then uh, start the match. And that was the content that gets shared online. When live streamers tried, tried to do that, they would just get confused. They need to multitask and try to get the audience involved, they need to acknowledge the audience. And then when it's like five minutes of awkward switching around, then they just don't want to play it. So that was the reason speedrunners flopped or stopped selling after selling a million years. Not necessarily a flop. So let's talk about good examples of streaming games. And this is very subjective to my experience because, like I said, it's very difficult to find the super top content. Twitch is now doing uh, a lot of strides to help with that. But so let's just dive straight in. Uh, the first one that uh, I personally discovered the love for, or like the type of games, uh, are survival and battle royale games. And I'm mostly talking about games like Rust where uh, I like to call it the real people interaction anarchy simulator. Because what you do in Rust is, uh, well, it's a survival game. You spawn, you gather resources, you build a base, and then at one point the whole server goes into anarchy. It's great. There is uh, a lot of looting and creative aspects involved. So by looting, I mean that you, um, you know, you'll rob someone, get their stuff, and that makes you stronger or more adventurous against the other people. And then the creative and social aspects are essentially, well, you can clan up with someone, then you're gonna build a base that is very difficult to uh, raid. So it, it kind of plays like in tone when, if this was the movie The Purge, when it's all anarchy for a day, that's you know, uh, your, uh, your style. Uh, and then it's also procedural. So every server is different. Every time the server gets wipes, it's all different. The other uh, game that I spent a lot of time on both watching and playing is H1Z1 King of the Kill, which is a battle royale, which means that it's a huge map, her people spawn in it, uh, only one survives. You don't have the survival mechanics, so uh, you just walk, uh, run around and loot for weapons and then kill each other. It's also highly, highly competitive. And the reason this game uh, became huge on Twitch is because some streamers got really, really good at it. And then you would want to watch them 
to see how they play it and what's their thought process behind it. So it's, while it's not necessarily an eSport, it's still uh, emerged uh, on Twitch as a top game. Uh, and what they did uh, was very smart at TwitchCon. Uh, they had H1Z1 uh, TwitchCon Invitational, which uh, I was actually seeing in that crowd right there shouting like crazy, um, where they invited the top players and the top streamers to participate in a tournament with tons and tons of cash prizes. So that tournament happens, uh, and you know, a couple of thousand people watch online, it's like you know, maybe no big deal. But it had a resonating effect where since they invited the top streamers, all those streamers would then play those videos of themselves playing live and then comment over their thought process and what was happening. And when you have that huge effect, huge residual effect, you would see the game just climb the top charts alongside of it. It was really cool to see. Another game that did really, really well during the launch uh, amongst uh, streamers is The Culling. It's also a battle royale game where 16 players get dropped into a map, you have to craft some stuff, you uh, equip uh, specific perks, and then try to kill each other. Now, what this game does, unlike any other competitive shooter or competitive game out there, is it gives you all of its perks at once. It just drops them on you. And that facilitates a ton of different gameplay styles. So I'm gonna show a short video here of uh, someone uh, killing another okay. guy with a... He's faster than me. Hang on. Or he's running at the same speed as me. Oh, you got, got him. You got him. Put it down. Holy shit. Let's see if Ray I can get the camera shot. Yeah. Oh! Oh! Shit. Let's see if Ray I can get the camera shot. Yeah. Oh! oh. So, what, what was happening there is people show off their skills but they're also showing off their builds of the characters. Since all of the perks are unlocked, you get overwhelmed as a player uh, with like, you know, hundreds of different combinations. So you start uh, to research, you go, okay, well, what is the best combination for the culling? So I would watch tons and tons of live streams and uh, that was, at that time, the culling was the top stream game which was then feeding back into the top charts where people would go like, I wanna build a stealthy ninja build. I wanna uh, run really fast, I wanna be silent, and then I wanna have uh, an advantage on throwable weapons. So you would see how that plays out. And then you would watch another stream where another guy is trying to make an ax tank build. And that was really cool to see. It went as far as um, people would build bots in the chat to like, uh, so you log in uh, to someone playing the culling and they go like uh, hashtag build. And then the bot would tell you which build that guy is using right now. And then with each update of that game, uh, you would see the live streaming numbers just peak because people were like, okay, they rebalanced something. What is the best build right now? That was really, really cool to see. And again, this was happening live. The other types of games uh, which I want to touch upon are the so-called roguelike slash procedural games. And we all know these games. You know, The Binding of Isaac is a classic. Nuclear Throne uh, by Vlambeer is also uh, one of those games that people can play every single day every single uh, time the same game, but it's gonna be different. And we saw this emergence of live streamers that would play the same game for months and months on end, get really big and then try to play another game and then uh, people would drop off because they wanna see that streamer play the same game over and over again. The other type of games that does really well is esports, but I don't think I need to mention this a lot. Everyone knows League, everyone knows Dota. But there was something interesting that happened a few months ago uh, with a little game called Warcraft 3. So for me personally, that was a huge thing to see, like my favorite esports celebrities from 10 years ago play this game on Twitch and then all of a sudden the online numbers start to spike. Because if you see Grubby, a famous uh, Warcraft 3 player, live streaming the game with a few thousand people, you will download Warcraft 3 again on your Battle.net and you will try to play it. And I saw this effect when people were just logging in and then playing with each other and then live streaming that. And um, one of the reasons I found that fascinating is because I feel like if 10 years ago live streaming had existed, Warcraft 3 would still be around. Because back then without live streaming, you would just, you know, you would download the replay, you would load it up in your game client and you would watch that. But hearing the perspective of those players, of how they think and how they approach it, it opens up a huge new perspective on everything that, um, that happens in the game. And that was really fascinating. All right, um, I have uh, a little bit of time to talk about our actual examples from uh, Tiny Build. So, Party Heart. 
Uh, party Hard, this game, was a very simple premise. 3 a.m., your neighbor's having a loud party, you wanna kill them all. That's the game. Uh, I'm gonna show a short gameplay clip, uh, which is gonna be very difficult to follow, but I'll walk you through it afterwards. So that was Party Hard. Um, skip to the next slide accidentally. Uh, in Party Hard, um, the premise is very simple. It plays a lot like Hitman. On a single screen, you see the whole map, you have to kill everyone and not get caught. So with that game, um, we didn't know that it was gonna be big with live streamers, so we decided to try and see what happens. And what we did is beta testing. Uh, the full game has 17 levels or 17 parties. Every single one is kind of semi-procedural, so even though there is level progression, you could replay the same level five, 10 times and get different results every time. There would be random events that trigger like all of a sudden aliens come or zombies come or whatever. So what we did is we would compile uh, standalone builds with a, a single party and just send it out to streamers. You know, usually you do beta tests where um, you just send it out to everyone who signed up for the beta. We didn't do that. We just uh, gave it to streamers and then we would just observe what happens. We saw streamers play, we would document the fun moments, we would figure out bottlenecks in the UI, we monitored the chat for what they found interesting. And then um, we found that the chat was like, oh my God, I really want the zombies to come right now, or I want aliens to come in, or I want a, a killer bear in sunglasses to come in and start partying and then kill everyone. Um, all of those things were really interesting to us. And the game was getting a ton of hype as well uh, alongside this beta test because you would see the top streamers play it and then you would report on it. And you know, we're getting tons and tons of coverage where uh, people were saying that it's gonna be you know, a very Twitch friendly game. So we decided to um, allow the Twitch chat to decide what happens in the game during the game, live. So we, our game client would have authorization to the OAuth key, which essentially lets you read and post into the chat of uh, your specific channel. So as you're live streaming this, your game actually connects to the chat. And then users in a democratic voting system vote for which events happen in the game. And then the game just scans the chat and interprets those commands. Here's how it looks in practice uh, in the example of PewDiePie. Okay, so you bros can vote for pest control, pizza, or razor. You basically do hashtag one, hashtag two, or hashtag three. I'm not sure if that resets the votes. Yes, it does. Great. All right, hashtag one for SWAT, hashtag two for bodybuilder, hashtag three for carnival. Yep. The SWAT team is coming. God damn it, I'm getting swatted on the stream. God damn it, no! God damn it! So what you saw there is the example of the fundamental problem with Twitch integration, which is the chat delay. Uh, because there is always gonna be a delay with Twitch streams uh, between 30 seconds and up to one minute, depending on where the origin of the stream is from, where uh, the viewer is. So we had to work around that, but essentially that's how the system works. There is a UI in the game that shows exactly what votes are happening, and it interprets live which uh, event is being favored for. So on launch day, uh, almost exactly a year ago, last August, uh, streamers, YouTubers, and press were streaming Party Hard on launch day, which was very interesting. Like the press, they were not writing reviews. They were streaming the game and then writing about their impressions of the live stream. And then we sell hundreds of thousands of units on a shoestring marketing budget. That was our first major hit with uh, live streamers and um, it took us a little bit to like figure out where we wanna go with that. And uh, the next thing that we did was uh, last January, which you may have heard of, uh, was Twitch Place Punch Club. Uh, it was a very uh, simple idea. It was like, well, everyone wants this game, so why don't we not release it 
until Twitch beats it, just like in uh, Twitch plays Pokemon. And that idea, you probably saw the results. Uh, you know, the first 10 days were really awesome, and then uh, in the first month, we uh, doubled that amount. I'm um, gonna show a short video uh, explaining exactly how Twitch Plays Punch Club works. Welcome to Twitch Plays Punch Club, a new Twitch streaming experience that sees Twitch users working together to train hard, find love, and punch crocodiles in the face. Punch Club is a 90s inspired boxing management sim in which you climb the ranks of the Punch Club leagues in a bid to discover who murdered your father. Twitch Plays Punch Club is a special version of the game that allows Twitch users to enter hashtag commands into the Twitch chat to vote on which actions our muscular hero should take. Like going to the fridge and eating a moldy burger? Will the Twitch community vote to head down to the gym and buff up? Or will they collaboratively decide to go drinking at the nearest bar, waste all their money, and wake up with the mother of all hangovers? But there's a catch. Punch Club will not launch on Steam or mobile devices until Twitch actually manages to beat the game all the way through. That includes taking the fight to the ring, where Steam codes for the game will be dropped into the Twitch chat every time they win a fight. The future of Punch Club is in your hands, Twitch. Don't make us regret it. So we essentially challenged the internet to beat the game. And it worked very simply. You just enter hashtag commands on what this is gonna be. And then my pitch to all partners is that it's gonna take them at least eight days to uh, beat the game. Well, they beat it in two, less than two actually, like 36 hours. Uh, and that exploded on the internet for us. Uh, that was such a powerful, powerful story uh, that it really helped us uh, think about live streaming uh, on a whole new level. Uh, the enabling of that is actually quite simple. It's just a self-playing build uh, with clear progress bars on what's happening. And then every time the chat progresses, um, it's also rewarded with a Steam key that drops into the, into the chat. So uh, people had a real sense of progression. And then it worked the same as a democratic system. And um, it was all held together, like not even with duct tape, it was just paper glue. Like in the back end, we were constantly restarting the build and uh, whatnot. But that worked, that really worked. And we're thinking about where to push that further. So let's talk about designing games with streamer appeal. And I'm almost out of time, so I'm just gonna briefly skim through this. Um, one of the things that we did was a game called One Troll Army is an event that was called Twitch versus One Troll Army. And that's a very simple uh, game where you play as a giant troll protecting a fort. You have waves of enemies coming in. And we thought, well, what if we, instead of using some sort of voting or democratic system for Twitch integration, what if we allow the people that are in the chat to control individual units in waves? Uh, this is what it looks like. What you like. want to do is like go behind the back of the people that are attacking the fort, take them down, uh, and like kind of avoid the people that are trying to chase you. Yeah, exactly like that. Yeah, Mr. Yuck, you thought you were clever. Oh god. Okay, okay, run away, run away, run away. You have very low health. Very low. Oh, and the fort is about to go down. Aw, oh, man. What the hell, people? That was a, a live stream that we did with Alienware just testing out the Twitch features. And it's very simple. You just um, allow a user to choose which costume is he wearing, what direction do you want them to go, at which speed you want them to go, and what kind of class of character you want them to do. Um, and that creates this feeling where everyone is playing against you live. Like you see your actual username as a Twitch user in the game. And that's a very empowering feeling because if you like, you know, cause they only like make your commands go to a specific way uh, and kill the, the player, that's a very empowering feeling. And we did this event where the price would drop uh, if Twitch beats us after a 10 hour live stream. So they beat us and we had to release the game for free. So that was fun. Um, and the enabling of that was quite simple. We just take the top 50 chat uh, activity people, just based on activity, put them in the game and each person assigns simple strategic commands and the costume. And it feels like playing real time uh, against uh, the actual streamer. It doesn't really, um, but it makes it feel like we, you know, we achieved something that works around the stream delay. A very short example of uh, designing uh, games with Steamer Appeal is the Final Station, which we released a few weeks ago. And I'm gonna skip the trailer here. I'm just gonna talk about the game. It's, uh, it's people call it the zombie apocalypse on the train uh, because there's a few gameplay elements. So you drive a train around, you explore abandoned stations, 
uh, you find out what happened in this world with a story, and there is intense combat sequences. So what we learned from all of the previous games is that people you know, that want to live stream the game, they need to have downtime. They need to have the time to actually talk to their audience. So we designed it in a way where it had really good pacing uh, that was atmospheric exploration. You go like, everyone loves trains, right? You figure out what happens in this world and then all of a sudden it gets very intense and very, very emotional. Uh, and then the deep story is something that streamers really like to explore where they go like, um, uh, figure out what happened here, what happened there, and combine bits and pieces of this world. And then the chat reacts to that in a really interesting and positive way. I'm just gonna do a short summary um, on the uh, Twitch and Tiny Build adventure. Uh, so, you know, we had a game that jumped on the YouTuber bandwagon and then fell off a cliff. And then we had to reinvent ourselves with uh, Twitch Plays, Punch Club, and Party Hard, and all of that built up to a philosophy that, hey, you have to design games specifically for a specific audience. So what's next? Um, just gonna throw some ideas out there. I'm really out of time, it's like flashing at me. Um, loyalty systems are a really good thing that you should think about, um, like uh, earning points uh, for participating in Twitch integrated games and then storing those points and having them transferred to other uh, games. Chatbots are a really, really big thing right now where you can have meta games going on alongside uh, the actual game. Uh, and subscribable beneficial rewards are also a really interesting concept. Like think about it, like uh, if I'm subscribed to a certain live streamer, um, what if uh, only subscribers can join them in the multiplayer session? That, wouldn't that be cool? That's already happening in a way, but uh, I feel like you guys you know, uh, can really push that to the next level. So happy to talk about that. Um, thanks for listening. Here are my contact details. Thanks for having me.